Yeah, he will just do it. Yeah, officer, Mr. Abu. Yes, sir. We have done it, sir. Sir, you can retry, sir, again. Okay. Okay. Sir, I have done, sir. Okay. okay. Let's see if you can do it. Can you now see my screen? Yes. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are uh, happy that uh, an eminent cardiologist and electrophysiologist is going Recording to Recording in progress. And uh, I request uh, Professor Patil to introduce the uh, speaker and the topic. Dr. Patil. Yeah. Thank you very much sir, for this uh, opportunity to introduce uh, my own disciple as well as now my colleague, a bright colleague of ours. Dr. Jay Prakash Center. He hails from coastal Karnataka and uh, he did his uh, MBBS from JJM Medical College, Davangere, then did his MD medicine at uh, KMC Hubli when we were associated together. Then he went to Mumbai for his DM training in uh, Tupiwala Medical College and uh, Nair Hospital, in Mumbai. And uh, he did his DM cardiology and both MBBS as well as DM cardiology. He had uh, he attained the awards, a best outgoing student. Then he went to Melbourne, Australia, in Royal uh, Melbourne Hospital, and he did his electrophysiology strain training. And he is heading the department of uh, electrophysiology at uh, Jayadeva Hospital, and he has trained many electrophysiologists, and he is one of the uh, reputed names uh, both in the national as well as international circles and he has produced many scientific papers with this little uh, recording mystery, stopped he is going to recording in progress diagnosis and management of syncope as we know we often come across vasovagal syncope and situational syncopes of course as cardiologists we also come across structural heart diseases as well as channelopathies which are causing Syncope also, and uh, he is one of the uh, great man who is going to speak on this subject. I request Jay to continue with this and give us more knowledge on this subject. Thank you. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Iyengar and my um, Dr. Iyengar, who was with uh, me a long time ago, and we are still together, and uh, my uh, dear teacher, Dr. C.B. Patil who has taught me many things in life. Most Thank importantly, you. being meticulous <laughs> and taking a good history, which I'll demonstrate it to you, how he used to do a pill count. You can't imagine people teaching you doing a pill count on a patient, which many <laughs> of you probably must not have seen. And, uh, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> but Thank he taught you. us, but I still, I still think it's, it's a great uh, thing. And it's uh, really an honor for me to speak here today um, now, this is something which I have been working on for quite some time. As you can see, I'll be sharing some of my thoughts and also some work which we have done in Jayadeva. And I have to thank, thank all my colleagues who have helped me uh, in, in uh, a few publications which we have done. And uh, I will share with you what we have done. Um, See, syncope is a very difficult problem in day-to-day -day practice. In fact, many physicians and cardiologists do not like syncope because it's a very funny sort of uh, problem, which is rather hard to diagnose and also uh, very difficult to treat. Because if you don't know the diagnosis, you definitely have a difficulty in treating. So, they would rather have, and there are not many interventions. Actually, there are interventions which I'll teach you uh, in today, which can be done in, pa uh, in patients with syncope, but they are not interventional treatments. So when somebody becomes an interventional cardiologist, there is nothing much to intervene. And um, so it becomes a very difficult problem and people tend to pass off. Whenever I see a patient coming to me with a huge file, you know, set of files, I know this guy has syncope because he would have gone through at least three or four CTs, uh, five EEGs, and, uh, you know, 
quite a few of the uh, other uh, you know investigations from the neurologist and many a times in fact hmm, i have been sent a few patients by dr jowli is he has even told me that look i am sending you this patient just before i am going to send this guy to this psychiatrist so this is um, rather unfortunate because we can do something uh, good to these people if we can uh, you know tease out the various uh, aspects of syncope which i'll be sharing with you and i am very fortunate that i have been given a one hour slot um here which is which is rather unusual and i hope to occupy all the one hour slot i will not be talking about all the arrhythmias because you as i go along you will realize how vast the topic of syncope is so with this brief introduction i will start my talk now so the outline will be a definition and relation to other causes of transient loss of consciousness which is a big group of uh, you know a uh, uh, problem then we'll talk about the classification some little bit of prevalence and the impact i'll not go into the diagnostic strategy i'll just definitely cover and some specific tests which i am going to sort of uh, you know um bring to your notice as to how best we can use this test and what should not be done and some of the specific conditions because as you realize that uh, when I, i talk uh, you will realize that it's a vast topic and you can't cover every aspect of syncope because a number of uh, um you know conditions can give rise to syncope now unfortunately or fortunately this topic of syncope has been sort of uh, um you know muddied by many terminologies as i call it uh, giddiness because when whenever my fellows or my cardiology fellows see giddiness the first thing they want to do is to get the get this giddy patient out of their room and the best person to dump it on is me second thing is a condition called as faint which again is a extremely vague term in um, britain it's also called as a lark because and a blackout so these are all very vague terms uh, the one of the other terms which has been used is a transient loss of consciousness which i will deal with uh, in in an, in the next slide and then we come to syncope and presyncope so let me tell you we should not use as medical people we should not use the first four of this giddiness faint lark and blackout are not allowed in today's guidelines to be used as medical terminologies so you can use a transient loss of consciousness which is called as tlock or syncope i'll tell you what is exactly syncope and what is tlock now pre syncope is something just the patient is going to pass out but he is not passed out so having said that let's see what is transient loss of consciousness it is a state of real or apparent loss of consciousness with loss of awareness characterized by amnesia and it's for a period of unconsciousness so they, it it may be true or false they might be abnormal motor control the loss of responsive responsiveness may be there and it's of a short duration so since it's transient it's only of a short duration so if a patient has told you that look i passed out and the next thing i remember is i woke up one hour ago in a hospital this is not transient loss of consciousness this is something else so the first thing which you have to decide is whether loss of consciousness is transient or prolonged and for that history is probably the most important and you have to ask these patients when you passed out what was the approximate time and when you woke up what was the approximate time which you remember which unfortunately in this days of interventional cardiology we do not have time to listen to so having said that there are broad group of uh, you know um, uh, groups which results in loss of transient loss of consciousness one is trauma induced which is maybe due to an accident and could be a concussion which could result in a loss of consciousness from anywhere from minutes to you know uh, half an hour to one hour um 
it could also be non trauma induced in which syncope stands first then you can have seizures you can have intoxications due to drugs which you must have read in today's papers so famous people who get into these intoxications and also metabolic disturbances which many of us uh, see in the in, uh, emergency department which results in uh, you know non trauma induced loss of consciousness there are also what is called as non true transient loss of consciousness which could be psychogenic which is not uncommon and drop attacks and cataplexy so let us look at this now when we say syncope it is not a diagnosis please believe me everybody thinks syncope is a diagnosis it is not a diagnosis it's just a symptom it is constellation of syndrome let us look at when we say a syndrome it should have at least two components to it it is a syndrome where there is a loss of consciousness which is rather sudden and it's transient usually syncope lasts less than 1 to 2 minutes most of them are a few seconds they just go off it is self terminating so you don't need to give a cardioversion or you're not going to give a you know chest massage or anything the re recovery is complete and rapid so just remember this so when you are taking a history you have to concentrate on listening to all this very carefully and this is due to cerebral hypoperfusion so cerebral hypoperfusion for a brief period of time results in syncope and most common cause is the drop in systemic arterial pressure or the blood pressure it could be preceded with variable warning symptoms like butterflies in the stomach you know a feeling of uneasiness you know uh, and these sort of things and finally when you have diagnosed this uh, syncope it is not a neurological disorder so please do not send this patient away to a neurologist i'll tell you why because they undergo a number of tests and they have anti epileptic medications for a long period of time before they come back again to us now syncope you have to realize as i have told you is only one of the many conditions that may result in transient loss of consciousness and giddiness as i have told you should not be equated with syncope because it's an extremely non specific term it can even be an imbalance like vertigo Uh, and it is usually not associated with loss of consciousness and may be used to describe a complete variety of symptoms now let us look at some of the classifications we can look at it in two different ways one is by etiology the second is by mechanism of how a syncope can occur so when we look at etiology it could be reflex a newly mediated syncope which will be the reflex vasovagal syncope which is the commonest form and usually are, is seen in about 30 to 40% of patients with syncope it could be vasovagal it could be situational situational would be you know micturition syncope cough syncope defecation syncope you know and very rare forms of syncope where you swallow and then you can have a syncope it's extremely rare but case reports are there you could have carotid sinus syncope and there are atypical forms of tilt positive syncope the second is the orthostatic hypotension where the more common ones are the drug induced which can cause postural hypotension and the volume depletion and then you have the primary and secondary autonomic failures like the secondary autonomic failures could be due to primary autonomic failures or neurological disorders secondary autonomic failures could be due to you know conditions such as uh, uh, diabetes and amyloidosis then you can have syncope due to cardiac or cardiovascular disorders which could be due to arrhythmias it could be due to drug because drugs could either induce um, you know vasodilatation and hypotension or it could result in arrhythmias you could also have structural heart disease which can result in syncope like aortic stenosis atrial myxoma etc by mechanism when you look at it you can have three different mechanism one where there is bradycardia second there is tachycardia third there is hypotension with no or minimal alterations in the blood pressure now syncope is extremely important because it's very common the investigation is expensive because people go through multiple sort of uh, you know investigations it's usually disabling to the patient it may not 
kill him, but it is extremely disabling. And uh, many of these patients finally land up having psychological problems. And you also have to realize syncope may be the only warning sign of sudden death. So sometimes there is a saying that in syncope, you wake up in death, you don't. So the reported frequency is anywhere between 15 to 23%, depending on the age group you're looking at. But by and large, most, most of the time, it's about 15 to 20% when you look at a mixed population. Even in military population, you can see that these are young, fit people. You have an incidence of syncope of 20 to 25%. So it's not uncommon. When you look at syncope, there, are, there is what is called as a bimodal distribution. One, which sort of peaks around 20s to 30s, the second which peaks up later. So the 20s and 30s are usually the reflex syncopies are you know, arrhythmic disorders due to primary electrical problems, which are small minority. The older ones are due to cardiac syncopies, which will come to later. And as we see that, less than 40 years, cardiac arrhythmias and structural heart disease form a very small percentage while as the newly mediated syncope becomes less as you grow older, and it becomes more common that you have orthostatic hypotension or structural heart disease or arrhythmia as a problem as, you, as one grows older. So depending on the age group, you have to decide about what is the cause of syncope. So you have to look at very carefully about each of this. Now in older patients, there is a problem. The age-related factors many a times complicate assessment in these patients because they have a lot of comorbidities like hypertension, cerebrovascular disease. There is memory deficit in these patients, so they don't even remember when they have fallen. And many of them might say that, look, I've just tumbled. They deny having lost consciousness, and there could be multiple causes of syncope, which starts from structural heart disease to multiple drugs these patients are taking. So, in older person, it's rather complex and you have to be careful about taking this care of deducing the cause of syncope. The triggers can be different. In young, young patients, usually it is warm environment, prolonged standing, and also, uh, uh, you know, alcohol, emotion, blood drawing, and after exercise, usually it's vasodilatation after exercise, not during exercise. While as in older patients, it's prolonged standing and you know warm environment that induces syncope in these patients. Why is it so important that we need to understand the difference between cardiac and non-cardiac syncope? It is because of the possibility of sudden death and mortality. In those patients who have a cardiac syncope, the mortality is very high and the risk of sudden death is very high. So if you look at patients with cardiogenic syncope to those patients who have non-cardiogenic syncope, there is a great difference in the mortality and sudden death. And it's very important for us to diagnose the, and isolate this patient and treat these patients very aggressively in those uh, with cardiogenic syncope rather than non-cardiac syncope. The most diagnostic objectives is to is to distinguish the true syncope from loss of consciousness spells, that is the seizures and psychiatric disturbances, and then to establish the cause of syncope with certain sufficient certainty to assess the prognosis and so that we may initiate effective treatment. See, unless you are able to sort of diagnose the cause of syncope, the, where there are very many causes, you may not be able to initiate effective treatment. Before we start the syncope diagnosis, one needs to go with four key questions for diagnosis. I always start with these four, four key questions. When they come to me with giddiness, I ask, did you fall to the ground? That is, was the postural tone lost? If the patient says, no, I did not fall to the ground, he may not fall to the ground if he is either lying down in bed or was sitting, but he would still slump if he was sitting. But most of the times, patients fall to the ground because they are in upright position. The second question is, were you aware of the surroundings? So that means, was it a complete loss of consciousness or not? 
Then the third thing is how quickly did you lose uh, consciousness and how long did it last? Suppose the patient says, look, I just fell down and got up. That is syncope. If the patient says, look, I lost consciousness. I did not realize where I was. The next thing I remembered was I was in the hospital, which means that the patient was at least unconscious for maybe about an hour or two. So that rules completely rules of syncope. The third thing is, how did you regain consciousness and were you clear-headed? Many of the patients who have seizures are fuzzy and they have postictal phenomena. Most patients with syncope are quite clear when they recover. They immediately know that their surroundings are clear and this is something that you should ask. So these are the four questions you should ask before you proceed with syncope. If you do not ask these four questions, please don't even bother to think about any other uh, you know, diagnosis thing. It is very important to take a detailed history. I'll tell you why physical examination, postural BP and echocardiogram. The important historical features that you should look at is the position, supine sitting or standing. Person who is supine and has syncope and wakes up is probably cardiac syncope. Person who's sitting and having syncope and standing still could have a neurally mediated syncope or a vasovagal syncope. Activity, those which occur with exercise will be probably due to cardiac syncope. And you know, after urination, defecation, patient says, I went to the toilet at night, I was passing urine and suddenly I felt unconscious. This is not uncommon. And this is maturation syncope. I said, uh, I get quite a few patients of older age group who come to me with this. Defecation and swallowing syncope are rather rare, but it will come uh, as and when, uh, you know, occasionally. Predisposing factors are very important and we should ask them the history. Where were you stand? So do not ask direct questions. That's what Dr. C. B. Patil uh, taught me, you know, ask them why, where, when, what, how. Don't ask them, did you stand? Did you lie down? Don't ask them direct questions. The next is what happened before the attack. They will say, I had nauseous feeling, feeling cold, sweaty, um, you know, pallor or sinus, sinusis. Sinusis will be there if they have cardiac syncope or skin color will be, if they will have pallor if they are going to have, uh, you know, arrhythmia or uh, neuro, neurally mediated syncope. The tongue bite, all these things you should question about. And after the end of the attack, when you woke up, were you nauseous, feeling, you find out whether they had you know, cold feeling and were the diaphoretic. All these indicate newly mediated syncope. Number and duration of syncope spells, family history of sudden arrest, cardiac disease, whether they were there before, associated neurological conditions, personal history like diabetes and medications are very important for you to ask. And of course, there are a number of drugs which can induce, uh, you know, syncope like the diuretics, which can cause postural hypotension to beta blockers and digitalis and antiarrhythmic drugs, which can cause bradycardia. So there are a number of drugs. And of course, illicit drugs are now becoming more prominent. So you should take very careful history and if necessary, get a drug test done on these patients. One has to realize that the history gives a very important clue to whether it was a seizure or not. The syncope is usually more gradual no, while well, a seizure is sudden and it is associated with headache, confusion, incontinence, eye deviation, tongue bite, and a prodome, and an, often an abnormal EEG, while as that is not so in patients with inadequate perfusion. Physical examination, if a patient has syncope due to fever, one has to think of a vasodilatation or a brugada. If there is a pallor, think of reflex syncope, and this would all be seen in the emergency department. So having sent a patient, I'll tell you, by a cardiologist, a young fellow with sinus tachycardia and syncope. And this patient had pulmonary thromboembolism. What had been missed is he had S1, Q3, T3 on his ECG and even an echo was not done. And this fellow had pulmonary thromboembolism. So one has to look at all these things, bradycardia, signs of trauma, signs of heart failure, and of course, murmurs. When you're looking at patients, you have to do, definitely you have to do a postural blood pressure, which we forget to do it. So usually you have to do it 
uh, you know, immediately after standing and one, three and five minutes after standing. It is not while sitting because I see many patients just being made to sit and BP being taken. And in case, in some cases, the symptoms will be delayed by five to 15 minutes. So head up tilt tests become quite, quite important in such cases, which I'll come to later. Of course, if you are in a, in, in the OPD, you can still do a carotid sinus massage, do it for five to 10 seconds. Don't upload supine or upright position, preferably on a tilt table. We usually perform it on a tilt table. The outcome is a six second asystole or a more than a 50 millimeter fall in systolic blood pressure with reproduction of symptoms. So unless you reproduce symptoms, you should not call it a syncope due to carotid sinus massage, absolute contraindication of carotid buoy, and complications are rather rare if you are very careful in examining the patients. There are certain features which could suggest the cause of syncope. The reflex syncope is there is an absence of cardiac disease and family history of sudden cardiac arrest. So there is no family history of sudden cardiac arrest, long history, multiple recurrences, and triggers of pain, hot environment, head rotation, prolonged standing, volume depletion, especially patient has had fever or loose motion, which we don't even ask in many a situation. I usually ask, do you, have you had fever during that time? Have you had loose motion during, were you vomiting? Or was it after a strenuous exertion? The patient uh, was running around in the field and comes and sits after some time, maybe at three or four minutes after that, he falls down. So that is usually a reflex mediated syncope. In orthostatic, they change the position suddenly and then they have a syncope. While as cardiac disorders, you will have history of prior cardiac disease, family history of sudden death, and usually occurs during exercise. So they exercise and they have syncope, or they are supine and they have syncope. It becomes extremely important in the emergency department for the initial, to, initial evaluation to determine the need for immediate hospitalization, early intensive evaluation, and this nature of subsequent management of syncope. And we have to assess the near term serious adverse events, that is death, injury, or syncope, or long term risk, which are hard, harder to define. Not every syncope requires hospital admission, admission and you know, treatment because they are quite, it is quite expensive. You know, we, unless one needs to make money out of it, you don't need to admit them unless you have a high risk patient. There are certain role, low risk factors which one should realize. In a younger patient where there is something which looks like a, uh, reflex vasovagal syncope, you don't need to admit them if the ECG is normal, no family history of sudden death, and prolonged syncope, multiple episodes of syncope. Some will say I've had syncope for about 5, 10, 15 years. So these are low risk factors. While as in older patients, those that occur during exertion or supine position associated with chest discomfort or palpitation, or a family history of sudden death, or patient has cardiac disease, or the hemoglobin is less than nine gram percent, or the systolic BP or a postural fall of BP is there, which is not unfortunate. People even don't look at the conjunctiva these days. They all want to intervene. So my, my humble request to all participants is at least look at the conjunctiva and Dr. C.B. Patil used to always make it a point that we look at the conjunctiva and the tongue. So if we did not do this, we would have been probably failed. And unfortunately, most of the present interventional cardiologists don't even touch the peripheral pulses. They don't look for anemia. They don't look for systolic BP. They don't look for postural falling BP. And it is my earnest request to everyone to at least look at this. Look at the abnormal ECG. Don't send the ECG to an electrophysiologist to diagnose. All of us are cardiologists. We have to have a basic understanding of looking at the ECG. Now, when you are selecting, don't use the shortcut approach. Head and CT MRI are the most useless diagnostic tests for syncope because syncope is not more logical. And also consider the cost effectiveness. One of the most important things about syncope is this ECG rhythm correlates. This is probably the most important thing in the diagnosis of a syncope. Now, the tel per lead electrocardiogram is very commonly used and it is used in the ER. 
always look for signs of acute coronary syndromes. Acute coronary syndromes can give rise to syncope in two or three settings. One is if you have a left main or left main equivalent, you can get a syncope. If you have a patient with uh, you know, uh, coronary spasm, then you can get a syncope because they can have arrhythmias. And acute coronary syndromes can also give rise to transient polymorphic VTs. Uh, and this could give rise to you know, uh, arrhythmias, which can give rise to this. So sometimes it could be subtle, sometimes it could be obvious. Look for acute coronary syndromes, definitely. Look for bundle branch blocks. Brady or tachyarrhythmias, it could be sinus nerve dysfunction. It could be tachyarrhythmias like an SVT or a VT. Look at the ECG and look whether they have got a WPW syndrome or anything like that. Look carefully at the QT intervals. Look carefully at the, you know, the repolarization indices, which indicates Brugada, short QT syndrome, or a early repolarization, which is extremely rare. And most importantly, do not miss this S1, Q, T3, T3 pattern. Not very uncommon and very easily missed. So look at all this. And if you have an obvious, you know, AV block, or a sinus nerve dysfunction, please don't miss it. Now, when we are looking at uh, patients for ECG symptom correlation, we look at various ECG forms. One is the Holter, which is there for 24 hours. I always say that Holters have a very low pickup because if you patients are sent for Holters, left, right, and center, you know, Holters don't make any of this thing because the pickup rate is very low. You, the patient may be completely asymptomatic on the day you give the patient a Holter and then you may not pick up anything. But if a patient says, look, I have a syncope every day, then it might be worthwhile looking at a halter. Otherwise, if the patient says, look, I have uh, symptoms once a week or once a month, you can look one of these you know, external loop orders, which are very easily available these days to look for syncope. You also have this external, uh, you know, um, outpatient telemetry monitors, which can be used to diagnose Easter, to get ECGs during the episodes of syncope, which can transmit wirelessly. And then you can get the ECGs for diagnosing the patient symptoms, and you will be able to do a better pickup of the rhythm during the episodes of syncope. It is quite possible the patient may have syncope and may have no rhythm uh, disorder, and that would easily tell you that, look, this patient doesn't have an arrhythmia, which is giving you the syncope. Or I'll show you later how we can pick up, uh, you know, vasovagal syncope, even on uh, ECG, either from an external uh, MCOT recorder or, a, you know, insertable recorder. I'll show you some, I'll show you an example of this. In those patients who have syncope, which is rather you know, farther apart, maybe once in two, three months or four months, and you are suspecting that this patient may have, uh, you know, a, a cardiac disorder or an arrhythmia, which you strongly suspect, but you are not able to prove, you can use this insertable, loop, uh, insertable loop recorders or the implantable loop, loop recorders. Um, there are two companies which produces, one is the reveal, the other one is the confirm. Um, you know, these are um, from two different companies. These can be inserted by a very tiny incision. And today we have something which is something like an injection, which can be given underneath the, you know, uh, just next to the sternum. And you can put this recorders, which has a battery life of about three years. It records, stores, and transmits ECGs remotely. It can be patient activated or, or automatically activated. And if the, it is indicated if the episodes are very rare and you're suspecting that there is an arrhythmic syncope. Now, this is a, a recording of a patient who had an activation. Now, look at this very carefully. You will see a, you know, an asystolic period and probably you will see that there is an auto activation which has happened when there is an asystole because the device is recognized. Look, this patient has a syncope, but the patient has passed out, you have to realize has no no real uh, has no remembrance of this but he wakes up and activates it at this point so the whole of this is recorded on this ecg but look at this very carefully now many people will be led to believe look i have to implant a pacemaker on this patient 
But look at this. This is something which I wanted to concentrate very carefully in this recording. I put this up specifically for the youngsters to recognize. Them. Look at what is happening. You will see a sinus tachycardia which starts. It starts out with a sinus tachycardia. That means there is a parasympathetic core activation. Then you'll see that there is a slow bradycardia and then it becomes more and more bradycardic and then you have a sinus arrest. Sometimes you can have an AV block. Some most commonly you have a sinus arrest and this is followed once the patient falls to the ground. Probably the patient has fallen to the ground. You can see some artifacts here. Patient has fallen to the ground and probably may have had a convulsive moment and that's what has been recorded. And then sinus tachycardia takes over and then normal sinus rhythm returns and probably patient has woken up within this period of time. So what you have to realize is this is, doesn't require a pacemaker because this is a newly mediated syncope. So there is a sinus tachycardia followed by a bradycardia and an asystole. So this can also, you will also see this in some of the Holter recordings. Now, some of the Holter recordings, especially at midnight, if you see a patient having an intermittent AV block, please rule out uh, you know, obstructive sleep apnea, which can also give rise to an AV block. So what I'm telling you is when you are reading a Holter, when you're reading all this, you have to give carefully uh, your you know, attention to various things. Suppose the patient doesn't have any change in the rhythm, in, in the rate, and suddenly you have an asystole, either due to an AV block or due to a sinus nerve dysfunction, then you should probably say that, look, this is a primary AV conduction or a sinus node dysfunction. So this is something which I wanted to concentrate from this. And the take home message is look at these folders very carefully. Now, depending on how frequent the syncope is, as I've told you, you can get various things. The DCG is less than 10 seconds, older one to two days, maybe at the maximum. External loop recorder, seven to 30 days. The M quad three to 30 days, and you can use this ILRs for a long period of time. Unmask the susceptibility when we suspect a uh, newly mediated syncope or vasovagal syncope, which is seen in about a third of patients with syncope, and we suspect it very strongly. We think of doing this head up tail test, it reproduces symptoms, and patients also learn the warning symptoms of vasovagal syncope and is more convinced because then you can have a patient having syncope under control condition and telling him, look, this is exactly what you're feeling. And then the patient is more confident of the diagnosis and say that, look, this is a rather benign condition. I'll be ready for it. So it, however, it is not recommended for predicting any treatment benefit. The indications are in those patients who have recurrent vasovagal syncope where you may not have if you have a classical history, I don't think you need to do it. But if you have a recurrent history then, and the diagnosis is unclear after initial evaluation, or you think that this patient has an injury, and you think still it's a recurrent vasovagal syncope, then you should do it. It's also used for delayed orthostatic hypotension, and also to differentiate the convulsive syncope from epilepsy, and also to establish the diagnosis of pseudosyncope. So these are all the indications and these are the 2017 guidelines from ACC. This is how we do it. Basic preparation is a four hour fast, continuous monitor, continuous BP monitor. Preferably we do not want to disrupt the autonomic nervous system. At Spigma manometer BP is probably discouraged. If you are going to place an arterial line, place it one, year, one hour before. The best thing to do is to use a FINA press now or an equivalent which is preferred. Many, pay, many places may not have it because this is a very expensive uh, device which costs about 50 lakhs. But now I'm exploring another alternative which probably will place it in front of you in a short while from now. It, usually the rest period is about five to 15 minutes. All of you should know it because all cardiology residents should do this head up tilt test. The test tilt protocol is what we, what we use in Jadeva is called the modified Italian protocol where we tilt for 60 to 70 degrees for about 20 minutes. The most important thing is please do not 
tilt back the patient if there is hypotension. Please do not tilt back the patient if there is bloody Allow the patient to have syncope. So it should produce syncope. It should produce this reproduction of sync, uh, symptoms. If it, if it doesn't happen within 20 minutes, then you need to use pharmacological provocation, nitroglycerin or isoprotonol. And once you give this, heart rate increases, you again tilt them. So you tilt them back, put them flat on the ground, give sublingual nitroglycerin, spray, or isoprotonol, you have to give it as an infusion. Heart rate has to increase to about 125% of the baseline before you tilt the patient again on the drugs for a duration of 10 to 15 minutes or patient has symptoms. We get different types of response, the most common being the mix, where the heart rate drops, but not to less than 40 beats per minute, but the BP drops before the heart rate. The second type is the 2A, which is a cardio inhibition without isostole, where the heart rate drops to less than 50 beats per minute, BP doesn't drop, the, you, know, you don't have an asystole of more than um, three seconds. Cardio inhibition with asystole, can, which is rather rare, but can happen. It is usually asystole for more than three seconds and precedes the BP uh, you know, fall. The third type, which is the second most common form, is the vasodepressor, where the heart rate doesn't fall and only the BP falls. So it's very important that one, two, and three do not benefit from pacemaker therapy. So this is the importance of recognizing this. This is our publication. We have used both isoprotonol as well as nitroglycerin. We have found that, you know, initially we started with isosorbide dinitrate, which was the tablet form, and we started with this. And then we went ahead and looked at sublingual nitroglycerin spray, which we now use more commonly. And it has a higher yield and, uh, you know, it is much quicker to perform. And unlike, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the um, isoprenaline, it does not give rise to too many arrhythmias. Isoprenaline can give rise to arrhythmias. And uh, like sinus tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, which we have had in this, uh, in this study, and this was published in 2017, um, heart, lung, and circulation. But the very, very safe test, we have already discovered one of the most rare complications, which is ventricular fibrillation. This ECG was brought to me by my fellow who did the test, this patient. So never ever do a test on a patient whom you have suspected coronary artery disease. My friend sent me a patient who had unsuspected coronary artery disease. Patient was put up on a tilt table test. Patient had an asystole, probably had hypoperfusion. Then we have started. CPR was initiated. The, the tilt table was put, put back. And then, you know, perfusion returned and slowly there was return of sinus rhythm. So before you send the patient for tilt table test, please be warned. Please look at whether they have coronary artery disease and rule that out. EP testing is something which is referred to many by, by various people. It has an extremely low AT in patients with normal hearts. It's probably more useful in patients with structural heart disease and the more di useful diagnostic observation are inducible monomorphicity, sinus node recovery time, which is prolonged, or a induced SVT with hypotension. For this, you have to realize that one needs to do a tilt table test along with an SVT, which is not possible in most labs. You could have a HV interval, especially if they have a bundle branch block, you have an HV interval of more than 70 milliseconds nowadays, or a pacing induced infernodal block. So these are the things which are, the limitations are that it is very difficult to correlate the laboratory symptoms with spontaneous symptoms, and the false positive is rather high. It is less effective for assessing Brady than for tachyarrhythmias, and usually one needs to be very consistent with the clinical history and the EPS findings before we, we fully you know, attach them together. Never ever send a patient with syncope for neurological tests. Syncope is not a neurological condition, and that is what I want to say, unless the patient has had an injury and a fall, and you're suspecting a subdural hematoma or a brain injury, there is no need for it. The EEG is mostly non-diagnostic, 
and usually of no value and don't waste the patient's money on this. If you look at it, as I've told you, as Dr. C. B. Patil has taught me, the most important thing in syncope is, is to, for me, I spend about 20 minutes with the patients of syncope before I come to a diagnosis. Then depending on what we find, we select the uh, you know, investigation. So as you can see, Holter is just a 2%. External group recovery is much better. In patients who are carefully selected, insertable loop, loop records are good. Tilt table is good in patients whom you have suspected newly mutated syncope. However, EP study only in those patients with structural heart disease and in whom you suspect an arrhythmic syncope is useful. So let's just move on to, I think I have bored you for 45 minutes. We'll just briefly go through the uh, you know, pharm non-pharmacological treatment strategies for reflex vasovagal syncope, which, is, which forms a very large um, you know, group of uh, patients with uh, syncope. So it's very important once you recognize vasovagal syncope to educate the patient and reassure them that this is a very benign condition. And many a times it has a bimodal dis you know, distribution. So it goes away by itself. So they will have multiple syncopies when they are in their teens and you know, early 20s, then it goes away completely. And it is non-lethal and you have to give them instructions. Salt and volume has been given in these patients with very, very limited efficacy. But what people say is take four to six grams of salt and drink a lot of water. It doesn't make sense. I'll tell you why. And Many a times, please do not ask them to take electrolyte drinks because you will see them coming back with obesity. The physical manuals you can use are the standing and tilt training, which I'll discuss, and muzzle tensing and leg, uh, leg crossing. One can use a support hose, uh, that is, um, you know, support uh, you know, uh, stockings, which are available, compression stockings, as we call it. And recently, we have done study on yoga, which I'll share with you. Please do not use fludrocortisone. It is rather not unused, not very useful. The only drug which is now available in India, which is useful in those patients who do not respond to other things, is midodrine, five milligrams twice daily. So you can use it. It's available, expensive, but it can rise to hypertension in patients who are prone for hypertension. This is how we do the leg crossing. Most importantly, we have to ask them to tighten their thighs and the buttocks when they stand up. They can use this ball to tighten their hands and pull on this. All these physical counter pressure maneuvers are useful in those patients who have warning symptoms. I always say that please go and lie down somewhere. If you have a bed or even if you're on a foot, just lie down for a minute or two, it aborts. If you have a warning symptom, like that you're feeling as if you're going to pass out with a pre syncope uh, but by and large, this has very limited or very modest um, you know, efficacy. What we realized in this patient's group of patients with reflex syncope is, we have just forget about this drug induced as well as this arrhythmic syncope. These are a totally different cup of tea. When you look at this, what you realize is this is not something which has got any structural cause, but it's an inappropriate reflex. That means there is a problem with uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which is abnormal, which leads to syncope. And this is something which uh, um, struck me. And when I looked through the literature, we found that, look, we need to probably look at it. People have looked at it in different ways to modify this autonomic nervous system, either by vagal stimulation, or I'll come to later that where people have done RF ablation of the where vagal innervations inside the heart where we have, we have also been involved in something. This was the, there are other studies, but this was the randomized study and it has been just published last month of yoga therapy. And we have found that it is quite useful in young patients with recurrent vasovagal syncope. We have used a series of asanas. Uh, for, I was fortunate enough because my fellow, uh, my uh, DM, you know, student, Vitesh Gangwar, who is now in uh, Kanpur, did this study, but he went away, then we had to put it together. And then I was associated with two other international people and we could get this through. And this is a very distinct because yoga is the only, only 
therapy which sort of modifies the autonomic system favorably. And there are a number of other studies which are also um, very positive in this group of patients with recurrent reflex vasodilator syndrome. It is not for one, one episode, but in those patients who are extremely symptomatic and have multiple episodes. So we also had another you know, um, review article on this, um, on the impact of yoga on cardiac autonomic function and arrhythmias. And we have found that it is quite usefully modifies the autonomic functions in these patients with uh, arrhythmias also. What is the use, what is the role of pacing? You know, the initial studies suggested that it was very, very positive. However, they were not double blind studies. And also we have to realize it can create a psychological response, what is called as a placebo response in these patients that modify the autonomic response. And however, we use this pacing in those patients who have recurrent syncope due to asystole. So you have to prove that, that every symptom is due to asystole, either due to you know, multiple recordings or the patient has had a recording during the episode. We have also been a part of this study where we have looked at um, uh, you know, um, doing what is known as um, cardioneural ablation. As I told you, we, we were a part of the study. We gave the case control part of our study. So one can modify the autonomic nervous system by ablating the, the vagal innervations into the heart. Uh, to reduce the episodes. And this is useful in those patients who have so-called vagal AV blocks, which is again, a recent paper has come out, and also patients who have vagal bradycardias. What about in, in carotid sinus syncope? Carotid sinus syncope pacing is useful to prevent recurrences in these patients, along with prevention of not using tight you know, uh, neck collars and also being very careful while they are you know, shaving and having any pressure on the neck. Orthostatic intolerance is another difficult condition which is rather difficult to treat, but here again, patient education and injury avoidance are very important. Again, fluid salts and of course, minimize caffeine and alcohol because they can dehydrate the patient and can work. We ask them to sleep at the head end of the bed elevated. We ask them to keep a small brick at the head end of the bed on two foot so that at least it is elevated by 25 centimeters. We teach them till, till training. Till training is we ask them to keep the shoulder on the you know, wall and then sort of train themselves in a, in a sort of tilted position for maybe five, 10 minutes twice a day. Of course, the leg crossing and arm tensing, as I've told before, and also the support horse and middle drink therapy. But this is rather difficult because this happens in older age group and many of them have other primary autonomic disorders which can cause hypertension when they're lying down and hypotension when they're starting up. So it's an extremely difficult condition. In structural heart disease, one has to be extremely careful because these are the ones who have the most life-threatening problems. We have to be very careful about identifying them especially in younger children, we have to look at very carefully at the ECGs to rule out you know, primary electrical disorders like the long QT, the short QT, the Brugada, the ERPS, and uh, you know, the WPWS, so that we don't put them at risk. In those patients who are older, we have to look at aortic stenosis, myocardial ischemia, pulmonary embolism, hy pulmonary hypertension, aortic dissection. So we have to assess them very carefully to assess the culprit arrhythmia or the structural abnormality very carefully so that we can initiate treatment appropriately. If you look at the tilt positivity rate, it is highest in those patients who have a trigger and is the lowest in those patients who do not have a, you know, a, a trigger or do not have a syncope. But nevertheless, some patients, even without syncope, can have a positive test. Look at this very carefully. There are certain patients with cardiac syncope who can still have a positive adductal test. And that's where we decided to look at this very carefully. And what we found out was that reflex syncope accounts for approximately 60% of the cases of uh, you know, uh, syncope in patients with structural heart disease. So before you say that, look, this patient has structural heart disease, 
and this syncope is due to a structural heart disease, you have to rule out everything before you, you know, do it. And here we had used, uh, you know, ILRs to diagnose this. It's a very small study, but nevertheless, very important. So when you are going to say that, look, you are going to rule out syncope, we had sort of coordinated it with, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bendit and others before we went ahead. So I think I have come to the end of my talk. So syncope is a common and a difficult clinical problem and probably history is most important for the diagnosis. Often diagnosed as seizures and it results in improper treatment. It's very important to correlate the ECG with the symptoms and ILR is a useful tool if you are going to use it in a selected group of patients and most important, a proper diagnosis and appropriate treatment is essential to not only prevent morbidity, but also mor mortality. Thank you all for a patient here. I thank you, Dr. Jay Prakash, very intellectual talk. I think uh, we could learn a lot from this. I think the syncope, most often we have to deal with it rather than sending to the neurologists and getting so many other investigations which are unnecessary many of the time, without a injury or whatever, a head injury or a inside, if there's a better to avoid the neurological consultation and concentrate on the proper history, examination, and carotid sinus massage. And of course, if there's a need, tilt table tests, all these things. And uh, you have already depicted your own uh, experience in this field with so many papers you have published and also the importance of yoga, as well as the importance of uh, physical manuals, which can uh, be helpful in, uh, in the treatment aspect also. I think with this, uh, I invite the comments as well as the from uh, others. Can I, can I, can I answer one, one, one comment, which uh, one question, which is there by Dr. Dr. Gaurav? Okay, I think there are uh, two questions. Two question. No, I see one. One is one says the far yeah. record, and this third, second says, sir, the example of ILR recording causing syncope was post exercise or stress or tachycardia followed by bradycardia. No, many of these syncopes do not see. Whenever you start, even when you do a head up tilt test, you'll realize that when the replaced vasovagal the tachycardia, sinus tachycardia. This is followed by the basal jarish reflex, and then you have this bradycardia, and then hypotension. So it need not be that this patient always has to exercise or do something when he has syncope. And this patient's recording was not due to that. Have I answered it? Yeah, I think. Uh, so, okay. Dr. Afsar Pasha, patients, not all patients with syncope will be benefited, or HUTT positive will be benefited. I made it very clear that you have four different classes of response. One is the mixed response where there is hypotension before bradycardia. They will never be because that forms about 30 to 40% of the group. The second is the patients will have only hypotension. So even if you, even here, if you're going to put in a pacemaker, these patients are not going to be benefited. The third is the type 2A where the bradycardia is less than 30 seconds, but they still have hypotension. So these are also not going to be benefited. It is only those patients who have recurrent bradycardia, which is prolonged more than three seconds and associated with syncope, where you have correlated these patients, ECG versus syncope, who are going to be benefited. Have I answered your question? Dr. Uma, thank you very much. It's a highly informative lecture. I'm very thankful to that. If I uh, enlightened someone, <laughs> and I, I want all of you. The whole idea of my talk is: please do not send syncope again and again. Yeah. You know those those patients can very well be you know handled by most of you. The most important thing in syncope is what to ask and be patient, listening to the patient. Never interrupt the patient. So for the first five minutes, I don't interrupt the patient. I just listen to them. I, I just keep asking, what is it? Why, what, how? And I don't even allow the relatives to talk. If the relative talks, I just ask them to keep quiet and tell that the patient has to talk to me. 
And most of the times, the patient comes out with a very nice history. There are very few people who are unable to tell you very, very clearly whether what, what is the sort of, whether it is giddiness or syncope. So there are some people who say, okay, look, this is what. Then I give them examples. I ask them, what do you mean by giddiness? They'll say, I'm feeling giddy. So I ask them, what do you feel, feel by giddiness? I ask them, do you feel as if you are being pushed? Do you feel unsteady on your feet? Do you tilt to one side or the other? That means that you're swaying. Do you feel as if everything is rotating around you or you are rotating around? The third is, do you feel as something, blackness is descending in front of your eyes and you are going to pass out? So when you give them the choices, they'll say, some of them will say, yes, I, I was feeling everything rotating and I was feeling you know, nauseous. And I, when I ask what happened to you when your eyes closed, they'll say, look, it stopped. That means it's a clear case of vertigo. And if, I, if they say that I'm swaying to one side or the other, it's naturally that there is a neurological problem. Then I ask, are you better? Are you steady at dark or during light? So many diabetic patients are unsteady during the dark because they are peripheral neuropathy. They confuse it with syncope and they come to sleep. So the whole question revolves around how we take the history. Do not give them leading questions. If you are going to give something, give them choices. Give them five choices from which they have to decide. The history taking, I think you have impressed upon everybody, I think. You are taught me, to, As well as orthostatic hypotension. Very, very important. The standing BP after three minutes, one has to wait and then take. One, I think, one, yeah. One, one, three and five minutes. Yeah, one, minutes three and, and five minutes. minutes. Correct. Hmm. Wonderful, Dr. JP, as usual, that uh, nothing less than this is expected of you. In <laughs> fact, you know, I had uh, a patient who had history of family history of sudden cardiac death. He had uh, bradycardia and also ERPS. And he also had a couple of uh, syncope. Indeed, uh, for such of these patients, what should be done for uh, in terms of uh, management and how do you look at a routine ERPS in your practice? Okay. Now, when we, uh, I didn't speak to you of, because uh, there is a complete different talk on syncope in mm -hmm. primary arrhythmia syndrome. Now, ERPS is rather common, but ERPS causing sudden death is rather rare. Now, if even if the patient has an ERPS, A, I would closely look at and see whether the patient has got long or short QT syndromes or rule out Brugada. And in these patients, I would be very careful because the only treatment for uh, ERPS is in implanting a defibrillator. Now, there are no drugs for ERPS. But before I do that, especially many of these patients are young, I, excuse me, many of these patients are young, they require device changes. And sometimes if you have done the wrong diagnosis, they'll land up. I've had patients implanted defibrillators for idiopathic VTs by cardiologists. Let me be very honest. I've had patients who had, who had accessory pathways with broad QRS tachycardia due to bundle branch block being implanted with an ICD. And the patients have come to me at, because of recurrent shocks. And I had to do an ablation in these patients and say, they come and ask me now, can you take this device off? Why did this doctor implant the device? So it is very important that we have our diagnosis right. In these patients, I would still look at if the syncopies are very farther apart, I will still go and implant an ILR in these patients, make a correct diagnosis before I decide. Wonderful. Uh, thanks Thank for that uh, suggestion. Of course, uh, you know, more about it, as Dr. Iyengar always says in a personal discussion. Thank you. <laughs> no, Dr. JT, uh, that was an excellent talk as expected as Dr. Uh, he says. Now, uh, uh, you know, I think after your lecture, we should all learn how to avoid inappropriate admissions mm. in these patients and yes. how to avoid inappropriate tests in these patients, keeping uppermost in mind the safety of the patient. I think it's a big lesson you have taught us. 
Secondly, I just want to know for your experience, you are largely look for some new things. Post-COVID patients coming with syncope, have you had any special situations or special diagnosis in these patients? No, I have not had, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I have not had many patients with COVID who have come, come to me with syncope. That I should, I should say. I've had COVID patients come to me with palpitations. Quite a few of them have, you know, you know sinus tachycardia as, as a part of the COVID. And we now do know that COVID can sort of, uh, you know, cause some sort of myocarditis in this patient, including, including in athletes. There are, you know, um, reports of uh, these patients coming with uh, various arrhythmias. So I, syncope, if at all patient with COVID comes to you, it will be during the time of fever where we'll have a vasodilatation or in those patients who have a brugada who, during the fever, the brugada worsens and then they can have a sort of a thing. So by and large, other than that, there are also small case reports. These are case reports, believe me, of patients with COVID who have had AV blocks. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe about a handful reported throughout in the literature, but I have not seen them. They also describe an entity postural orthostatic, orthostatic syndrome. Yeah, there is a condition called, I have come, I have a lot of patients who have looked at the doctor Google and come back to me, but mm -hmm. these are not truly post. I always, the first thing I ask is, have you consulted a very famous cardiologist? They say, yes. Then I say, is it Dr. Google? Then I say, they say, yes. <laughs> then I had one recently, just about two weeks ago. Um, you know, these, most of these patients are ITBT patients. And uh, when I ask them, yes, then I put the patient on a halter. The patient's halter is completely normal. So I, yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think it's, see, Google has given rise to many, many misconceptions about this. And uh, it is, probably, you know, made the waters very muddy, as you call it. More difficult and for us. If you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you type, you know, if you type syncope, you will get sudden death as the first diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Any adenosine sensitivity, adenosine levels, are they going to help? Noradrenaline levels? There is, see, there, yeah. there, 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 is, there is a very rare condition called, there is a very rare condition called as ATP positive, which I did not want to yeah. confuse this group. This is yeah. a very small subgroup. Very small subgroup. Yeah. This is a very rare. Finally, mm -hmm. we are not able to do this test. Most often, this is a rare reported in literature. Yes, I did not keep, always when I talk, I want people to look yeah, at yeah. in my, uh, I, 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 I was taught this by a very famous person. I, I will not reveal the name. He told me first thing, suppose you want to become the best headache specialist in this world. Mm -hmm. You have to remember and memorize the first 10 causes of headache. There will be 99 to 100 causes. If you mm -hmm. memorize the 10 different causes of headache, first 10 causes that fit into your 99% yes. of your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So that means you are going to be 99% successful. Yeah. So if you are going to look at only that 1%, then you're going to fail. Yeah. So I didn't want to bring on these very rare syndromes, including yeah. blood hair, short QT. Short QT yeah. will be very small. I would be yeah. muddying the waters for people who are listening there. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm. Is there any role of uh, propranolol in your practice in these orthostatic mm. No, I see, I think all these studies, propranolol, see, none of the drugs work, except midodrine to some extent. Midodrine. Okay, they, they have used propranolol, they have used clonidine, they have used, you know, Lot of other drugs, sibutramine, so a lot of drugs are there. In fact, I have reviewed quite a few papers on this. Um, I am a peer reviewer for many of the journals. Most, most do not act. Mm. And, you know, reflex syncope is something, it's a reflex. You can't just give water and say that you're, you're altering the reflex. That's where I looked at yoga. Because if you are going to modify, you are going to modify the whole sympathetic, parasympathetic system and balance it rather than looking at only sympathetic or parasympathetic, mm -hmm. or you're not even looking at that. You're only giving them volume. So that's not going to change the reflex, correct? So that doesn't make sense. And so there is very, very little evidence for any of these drugs. Beta blockers, I think they may be harmful also sometimes. 
should should not be yeah. metaprolol yeah. metaprolol yeah. has been tried metaprolol has been tried propranolol has been tried yes clonidine has been tried lot of other drugs yes so don't use drugs it doesn't work okay thank you mm. thank you very much uh, uh, dr jay prakash for that excellent uh, teaching i would call it mm. how to manage syncope and uh, i thank dr patil yeah thank you sir mm. and i thank all the uh, delegates who logged in and thank uh, manipal uh, team for this providing this platform thank you jp once again thank you jp oh, i have to thank you for giving me this platform <laughs> sir is our okay, pleasure okay some of, some of the some of the things that we have done in syncope because good. um this is something that uh, we have been working on and uh, hopefully we'll do something more in future okay yeah good great luck. work <laughs> and uh, <laughs> good experience <laughs> thank you Mm. thank you thank you very much thank you mr abu uh, thank you good night thank you officer yeah. thank you sir good night sir thank you jp again good night, thank you, i hope thank there you. are no other questions i think that's <laughs> no other questions i'll forward it to you any questions <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir thank you you thank made you. it bye very bye. clear thank you bye bye, mm. bye, bye. Yeah. take care thank you sir good night thank you sir record